Remember when the internet was fun? When it was new? Remember memes and cat videos and mashups? Remember when it felt like hope and change? I first got online in the ancient days of the last century. I've been making the internet and making movies about the internet ever since. I used to think putting the internet into people's hands was a recipe for freedom and democracy. It didn't turn out that way. Now the internet companies are huge and they don't act like our friends. Shady hackers harvested our attention, subverted democracy, and we traded the cat videos for Nazi memes. The internet got old and kind of boring. And so did I. These days, it feels like it's me versus the screens, and the screens are winning. The internet stole all of our attention. It's sneaky that way. You wake up one day with a smart toothbrush. Your family's exercise is recorded in the cloud, and your refrigerator is talking to your phone. How did we get here? I feel like we're living in a time where anything that isn't connected to the internet is about to be. I still think the internet has a higher purpose, but it's getting harder every day to keep the faith. My name is Brett, and I'm on a mission to understand the new internet. The internet of everything. CS, let's get nerdy. Consumer Electronics Show is America's biggest gadget showcase. Hello? What is this? So this is an automatic cat toilet. I is this connected to the internet? Yes. What is it? Uh, it's a smart sprinkler system. Does it connect to the internet? Yes, obviously. Does this uh, connected diaper connect to the internet? Yes, it will tell you the moisture and also if it's a pee or if it's a poo. This year's biggest trend, the connected home. What you'll see over here is our uh, Sensei kitchen faucet. Um, it's activatable uh, touchlessly. It's activatable manually. Um, and then now also via voice. So consumers can use Apple, Google, um, or Amazon to turn the faucet on and off. And then also just spend. Google. We'll want to show you our, our new Me 2.0 toilet. So we talked a little bit about intelligent toilets. Your Amazon Alexa is actually embedded into this product. You spend time in this space, use Amazon Alexa while you're in here to set the mood, play the music, change those lights that you just saw. So all the capability of Alexa built right into the toilet as well. Usually this is not a place where I want the internet to be, right? Why have you guys put the internet in the toilet? Not necessarily meant for you to have to use it while you're on the toilet. It's meant to use while you're in this space. Ah, so that's the way that you bring the microphone into that room is via the toilet. Alexa and the Google Homes have embedded microphones already. I'm just giving it to them in a more seamless experience and also kind of a use case that makes sense. Can you tell the microphone to not be on? Of course. You can always turn the microphone off just like you can do with Amazon and with Google. Okay. I'm sold. I get it. A microphone in my toilet is the latest example of tech companies trying to make themselves indispensable. That's why they need to make all the dumb objects inside my home smart. Open can. <laughs> At CES, really what you have is Google and Amazon going against each other with their smart assistants, trying to prove whose smart assistant has the most utility, which one it can be in the most devices, like billions of devices, and who's really going to win out the smart assistant wars. These companies have a whole new vantage point into your life. It's a computer in your bedroom. It's a computer in your living room. It's a computer that's listening. It's a computer you talk to. It's a computer you're friends with. Why Google or Amazon would want to build those seems totally obvious to me. The business of Google is not a search engine. The business of Google is knowing as much about you as they can know. It seems like yesterday that I was surfing the web and Google was just trying to help me catch a wave. Now it's a mega corporation monetizing my bathroom. Who knows what the consequences of connecting our homes to the internet will be, but it's happening anyway. Wikipedia says that by 2020, AKA now, 30 billion devices will join what is known as the internet of things. The pizza delivery drone. It's the inevitable result of computers getting smaller and smaller. You start with industrial computers, 
computers were incredibly expensive, there'd be one at MIT that everyone would share. Then computers got cheaper. People started getting them in their houses. Then you got mobile phones, and that really meant that humans were, for the first time, completely uh, trackable online. And then the Internet of Things is getting all of the electrical products in your house online. It's If there's something that has electricity, it's going to be Wi-Fi connected, and that's the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is like a never-ending gold rush. There's limitless possibilities when you're on a mission to connect everything on Earth. It's a bonanza for Silicon Valley. Is this San Francisco as good as everyone says it is? Yeah. The companies that are shaping our country and our world for better and for worse are made here. Uber, Airbnb, Facebook, Google, these aren't made in Brooklyn. These are made in San Francisco. If you're a 22-year-old and you want to make your fortune in America, you come to Silicon Valley. I mean, the Internet of Things is successful because it makes life more convenient. And humans are willing to give up all sorts of things for a modicum of convenience. For a hint of what my fellow nerds would bring to market in the next few years, I went to an investor pitch day. We kind of see uh, the most interesting stuff in the connected space as being things that um, sort of improve whatever process they're part of because of the access to data. So whether that's a health tech product that helps you understand overall patterns in your own health and other people's health, or whether it's a product that helps um, in an industrial manufacturing process, anything where there's kind of a, a Trojan horse into a larger world, we find really interesting. Every startup I met was connecting something to the internet for the very first time. One of them was aiming to collect data from inside a human body. This is Keg. It's a small Kegel device that vibrates, and while you are exercising your pelvic floor, uh, the Keg is sensing the data about your intimate health and your fertility. So this data is pulled into our cloud. You get a fertility result, but you also can export it and connect to the fertility specialist. It's very cool Fitbit for your vagina. So this is a healthy woman. Here is when she was ovulating. And this is the window where she was able to conceive. Her best time was like here. Then we have a woman that has uh, problems with hormonal balance. Her chances of conception are actually lower and her fertility window is much shorter. There's like a huge disconnect between the real data, what is happening in you and science. And then it's like a lot of nonsense. So like really help a lot of women. Half of my team are women, electrical engineers. So every time we make something, we immediately test. What's it like to be a female founder in a, such a geeky kind of world? Okay, that's terrible. <laughs> Why? Uh, because I'm... So, okay, the market is huge. But uh, pitching men investors product for vaginas, it's very challenging. How long did it take you to make all that? This to this, eight months. Hold on. Has a line been crossed here? Should the human body be off limits to the internet? Christina's startup is certainly pushing these boundaries, along with a steady stream of wearables, implants, and other devices joining the internet of things. Companies are measuring our heart rate, our breathing, our sleeping. We send this data to our phones and to the cloud. Once it's in the cloud, it becomes a resource. Companies can decide how they want to use it, and some of them sell it. Data broker is a, is a huge industry in the United States, gathering all this information and then selling it. Traditionally, it's been used for marketing and advertising, but now it's being used more and more in the healthcare space and in the health insurance space. They are ranking you and scoring you based on their algorithms definition of whether or not your lifestyle leads to healthy habits or unhealthy habits. You know, if a woman buys plus size clothing online, they predict that she's more overweight and more likely to be depressed, therefore more likely to have high health care costs. That could lead to people paying higher rates. There's a proliferation of devices, you know, that can track our health information. But the technology has moved beyond where the law is to actually put protections in place for consumers. And so the data can be used in a lot of ways that people would never even imagine that it would be used. This is Eric. He has sleep apnea and uses a CPAP machine to sleep at night. That I snore really, really loudly, and I keep my wife up 
So in order for that not to happen, uh, I have this really ugly machine that I put on my face and that blows air into it, which is like a horrible thing, but you do it for love. But what Eric didn't know was that his insurance company was recording his snores, secretly monitoring if he was using the device properly. Then they called him up. Oh, it says you haven't been compliant. And I said, well, what do you mean I haven't been compliant? What does that mean? And she said, well, it looks like you've only used the mask for like three hours on Tuesday and four hours on Wednesday. And that's when the like record stopped for me. Poor Eric. The insurance company used his data against him. His private American health care denied him coverage for a new mask because the data showed he wasn't using the machine properly. Let me get this straight. The reason you're not giving it to me is because I haven't been compliant. And the reason I haven't been compliant is you're not giving me the thing that you need to give me. <laughs> Just like. <laughs> this is the reason why we started CAG. CAG is the only patent pending device, consumer device, which is tracking vaginal environment for fertility. So the device take the fertility data. And they are also looking for how to use our data for the future of the research, because as you can imagine, we are collecting also the data that we don't know now what they could be useful for. Because fertility doctors are going to hate you. <laughs> the winner of our session is Keg. Please come on up. <laughs> People who want this data the most are our users, you know, they want to know their health data. Um, so we will probably try to just elaborate every model so we can monetize there. But I would try to avoid selling to third parties if possible because, you know, like, what do they, they will create a crazy insurance model for women who are at risk, amazing, you know, like you don't really want that. Say more about that. You don't want to create a disadvantage for someone in the whole system just because you have their data. You know, electric toothbrush, it knows how often you're brushing your teeth. So it knows, you know, how likely you are to get like something wrong with your teeth, which then affects your insurance rate. So this is, this is what I'm talking about. And when you have a woman which is, which will have fertility problems in future, would you want her to have like higher insurance? I don't, like I personally, I don't. Living in the future is weird and confusing. I like what Christina is doing, but I do wish she had some legal guardrails. We don't really know the worst case scenarios with the internet until after they happen. And it always seems like something that's convenient for one person turns into a nightmare for someone else. So my name is Fariel Nijem, and I'm a survivor um, of domestic violence and specifically also tech abuse. My abuser, he utilized our smart home against me and used it as a means of control and harassment. Everything could be controlled by these apps. Um, so he didn't even have actually have to be in my presence. He could be out of the country, thousands of miles away. With this tech abuse, the way that he was utilized the house against me was really through sleep deprivation. And that sleep deprivation really added an extra layer to the mental anguish that I was going through. I would be asleep, dead asleep at one o'clock in the morning, for instance, and all of a sudden, the audio system just blares up this horrific, violent music. You're shocked awake. Um, it is scary because it's pitch black and I would turn on the lights, of course, and go to the iPad and try to turn off the system and he would then either switch the lights on and off, he would flicker the TV on and off, he would turn the audio on and off. That would occur not for a few minutes, like four, five, six hours. This is used as a tool to harass you, to stalk you within your home. It's hard. It's hard even with all the trauma work that I've done. It's, it, it's triggering because it takes you back to that night. It takes, you, it takes me back to those moments of where I felt hopeless. I felt hopeless. We're all giving up some of our autonomy and human 
power to these devices. Always, constantly, every day. The reporting on situations of domestic violence with smart home technology made me realize how bad it could get. Things do feel pretty bad, and it's not just me. While I was making this film, our relationship to the internet and its makers reached an all-time low. Even internet executives were feeling guilty. We have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. I would be ashamed if I were you. And that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake. I feel tremendous guilt. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. The internet, a scientific breakthrough, is punished by the gods. Smart cities will pullulate with sensors, all joined together by the internet of things. Your mattress will monitor your nightmares, your fridge will beep for more cheese, click by click, tap by tap. Data. Computer says yes, or computer says no. What will it mean? Pink-eyed Terminator sent back in the future to cull the human race. What is going on? We're living through this painful transition caused by the internet. And if history is any guide, things are only going to get weirder. Jeremy Rifkin has studied other times of massive change. He sees a pattern in these apocalyptic times of digital disruption. What we're really talking about here is a digital revolution across all of society, around the entire planet. So we need to understand the the full um, implications of what this is all about. And the best way to do that is step back and ask, how do these great technological shifts in history occur? At a moment of time, three defining technologies will emerge over a civilization and converge. First, new communication technologies to more efficiently manage our economic and social life. Uh, second, new sources of energy to more efficiently power our economic life, social life, and governance. And third, new modes of mobility and logistics to more efficiently move our economic, social life, and governance. So in those rare points in history where new communication revolutions converge with new energy regimes and new modes of mobility and logistics, it transforms the way a civilization organizes its collective life. According to Rifkin, the first industrial revolution was caused by a new source of energy, coal, which powered a new communications medium, the steam-powered press, and a new logistics infrastructure in the railway. Locomotives, national transport, hub-to-hub -hub traffic. We got the first major industrial urban centers, and um, our business models move to a market capitalism. Second Industrial Revolution in the United States, uh, another convergence of communication, energy, and mobility that changed everything. The telephone. Try to imagine for the first time in history, in the late 19th century, people are picking up this little device and their voice is traveling virtually over thousands of miles at the speed of light. And then later radio and television, those communication technologies in the U.S. converged with a new source of energy. The Texas oil wells came in. And then Henry Ford put out that cheap internal combustion engine powered by that oil. We went from national markets to the build-out of global markets. It changed our way of life. The last two revolutions left us a world powered by oil. It's led us to the largest crisis we've ever faced. The second industrial revolution, it's fading away. I, I think we kind of smell it, we can feel it. We are now on the cusp of a third industrial revolution. We're 30 years into the World Wide Web. Three and a half billion people are connected digitally in their communication. That communication internet that's now connecting the human race is just now converging with a renewable energy internet. Millions of people are producing their own solar and wind, and what they're not using, they're sending back on an increasingly digitalized power grid. Rifkin's thesis is that communications and energy are already online. And when autonomous vehicles connect to smart roads and urban infrastructure via the internet, the third revolution will be complete. 
Communication Internet Digital, Renewable Energy Internet Digital, and Mobility Internet Digital to manage, empower, and move economy and society. They ride on top of a platform, and that's the Internet of Things. We don't need to wait for self-driving cars to see how the way we move things has been changed. Shenzhen is the city the Internet built. Anytime you order anything electronic from Amazon, you've set off a chain of events that would have passed through here, the Washan Bay Market. 90% of the world's electronics come through Shenzhen, and that's why this former fishing village went from 30,000 people to 12 million in 30 years. It's central to Chinese tech companies like Tencent, Alibaba, and Huawei. This is not a shopping mall on steroids. It's part of the world's most advanced electronics supply chain. Each one of these booths is actually the front office of a factory on the outskirts of Shenzhen. The moment I check out my order, the internet connects me to this factory. And if you're making a new device for the Internet of Things, there's nowhere faster than Shenzhen. In this market, you'll find every piece necessary to build whatever you can dream up. It's why Christina joined the never-ending parade of startups who come to Shenzhen and prototyped keg. I came to Shenzhen because you can quickly, quickly, quickly prototype. So for example, when you do a prototype in the United States, it takes ages to get anything ordered, a PCB made, PCB assembled. But here you can do everything in one day. Really new, like for example, this subway station. A year ago it was not here, they were not open. Yeah, they're like moving super fast. China is quickly moving to become the leading nation of the third industrial revolution. This is not well known in the West, but China's leadership began to realize that CO2 was a big problem. The chairman of the national electricity grid, the state grid, announced a massive multi-billion dollar effort, now operational in the, uh, in the new five-year plan, to digitalize that entire utility grid, put it in place, generate their own energy, and share what they don't need back to the grid. Boom, like that. They're putting out millions of electric vehicles right now. Millions right now, over the next few years. They're already in production. It's hard not to be impressed by China's speed. But the implications for connecting an entire society go beyond smart energy grids and can be, well, creepier. Chinese cities now collect data from millions of surveillance cameras, from public transit, and from sensors embedded in street lights and buildings. Data about where people are and what they're doing. If you live in Hangzhou, you are part of an experiment in modifying the behavior of citizens known as social credit.我今天采用的扫码上传的方式是这个前江分爱心使者和文体达人那低碳行者呢顾名思义就是如果你的出行是用共享类的那我们的水上巴士公交系统还有共享单车或者是你自己喜欢走路那它都会给你相应的一个积分我现在的分才五百八十九所以我现在还只是
that has completely replaced cash. Its algorithm examines your purchases to determine trustworthiness. It's kind of like if Amazon was your bank. 像这两个系统，他们的工作人员可能对我整个人他就一起。一清二楚，甚至是这种系统，其实就是你人的一个全部。它可以看出你各种你的一些生活习惯啊，你的一些品质啊，甚至你的一些性格，它其实都能看得清清楚楚。对对，可能还比我自己更加了解我自己。How do we ensure that governments don't prolong this Internet of Things third industrial revolution? And use it to hack the elections of other governments. That's already beginning to happen. How do we ensure that internet companies, whether it be Facebook or Google or Amazon or Alibaba, don't monopolize this internet for commercial purposes, commodify the lifetime value of all of our personal experiences and our data, then sell them to others, and then commodify us and actually, through algorithm governance, actually guide our lives? That's already happening. Algorithms have begun to play a role in the governing of cities in North America as well. Vancouver was the first city in Canada to deploy predictive policing. Artificial intelligence analyzes data about past crimes, predicts where a crime might happen next, and sends cops to prevent it. The main driver that motivated us to even go down this route was. Uh, a significant increase in property crime. As you can see, just in this first quarter, we went from 647 residential break-in injuries in the first quarter. We rolled out predictive policing April 1st. By the beginning of the end of first quarter, the beginning of second quarter, we dropped to 438 residential break-in injuries. That number is the lowest number of residential break-in injuries we have going back 30 years of data. So when we load this up. This shows the active forecast. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight houses. That is Pretty much, in. one of them out of these uh, out of these six locations will probably observe something suspicious. Does this actually work? Yeah, you saw the numbers. But it, like, so, but it, on any given time, if a police officer goes there, they have a thirty to sixty percent chance that they will actually prevent that. Yeah, you have to have cops everywhere. On all those locations that rotate every、uh, two hours. We're just coming up onto McGill Street, off of McGill. So we're literally right in the forecasted location right now. They're often breaking in in the middle of the day. Yes. Yeah, you'd be surprised. Between two to four, you actually get quite a few. Looking for anybody that looks like they would be casing a place. This is algorithmic policing, and that's what we're talking about. Is all it's the advent of algorithmic policing permeating into everything we do. Vancouver police are seeing results after only a year. Los Angeles has had systems like this for far longer, and it's producing some unintended consequences. The 50 blocks that comprise LA's Skid Row are one of the most heavily policed areas of the United States. This 50-block neighborhood is where many of the 48,000 homeless people in the city live. It's also home to the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, who have been opposing predictive policing since 2009. One of the ways to speak about data-driven policing is that uh, uh, certain communities are very much overrepresented in this data. So, in essence, it creates a feedback loop of the same, you know, just deployment of, of policing in these communities. Skid Row lies next to some of LA's most valuable real estate. It's bordered by the Arts District and the downtown core. Layered on top of the entire city of Los Angeles is an algorithm called PredPol. Systems like PredPol analyze crime data to produce a series of 150 square meter hotspots around the city that determine where police officers patrol. Whenever someone reports suspicious activity, the algorithm collects that data. So right now we're standing right here, right? Yeah. So we filed for public records to see, like, okay, so what were the hotspots? Then the hotspots were on the periphery, on the outer boundaries of Skid Row. So you have the gentrifiers who are moving in. They see somebody from Skid Row walk into the neighborhood, and immediately they call the cops. 
So that's a call for service, that there's a suspicious person in my neighborhood. So the, 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 the whole idea is to create this whole digital boundary um, where somebody walks in from Skid Row and goes across Los Angeles Street, where there's hipsterville and bars and everything else, they're going to be thrown up against the wall, they're going to be harassed and intimidated, and basically given a ticket. And contained. And contained. I've been a resident in Skid Row for uh, 15 and a half years. So I've been around a long time. I've seen, uh, I've seen it evolve. We're in a situation where this incredibly valuable land uh, is desired by gentrifying developers. What pisses me off the most about this entire situation is the dehumanizing criminalization of the homeless. You think these predictive policing programs are part of it? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Vancouver has its own skid row, the downtown east side, one of the city's oldest and most resilient neighborhoods. Residents have survived some of the highest rates of addiction and mental illness in Canada. Targeting residents with algorithms isn't going to help anyone. So what do we do? We actually force the system, if it's going to generate a forecast there, we force it go outside of there and take the next best one because we do not want that to occur. We don't want to have a police um, military occupation within areas that obviously have social societal issues. How do you introduce ethics into a system like that? You can't. And that's the one thing with machine learning. It's impossible to build in an ethical subroutine into machine learning. It deals with the parameters that a human has decided it should examine, and then you tell it what its end objective is. Like, there's a lot that can be done with AI. And I think kind of one question you should ask yourself at a human level is, should we be doing it? And I'm not sure that question gets asked a lot of the time. And if you kind of look at it and something you're doing has a creepy factor to it, I don't think we should be doing it. Hmm. Creepy. Would it feel creepy to live inside a neighborhood created by a company in the business of surveilling you? Google's parent company is called Alphabet. Alphabet owns a company called Sidewalk Labs. In 2017, Alphabet's Eric Schmidt traveled to Canada and proposed Sidewalk Labs built a neighborhood in Toronto from the internet up. Wouldn't it be nice if you could take technical things that we know and apply them to cities? All of these things that we could do if someone would just give us a city and put us in charge. It's no joke. They've proposed a city that bakes in the internet. But try and Google what it will look like, and all you'll find are images that look like 1970s science fiction covers. The only thing that's clear is that the internet will be in everything, and that Google's sister company is in full-on PR mode. You can in increase the green space, the density. Sidewalk so Toronto is a new type of complete community here on the waterfront in Toronto. Okay, go ahead. And so what we're looking at here is how new technologies can try to make cities better for people. You're looking right now at a street that has a configuration for two lanes of traffic. Right. That's probably actually too much for a street of this width. So you could imagine uh, maybe on the weekend you want to use it like a plaza. So yeah. the street turns white, you block off the edges in red. Or maybe in the morning it becomes a, a bike highway. So you have bike lanes that might cool. be to tell you directions and then a crosswalk to keep people uh, moving across it. The concept that's emerging is for an adaptive city that can respond intelligently to signals collected about weather, traffic, and people. Have the city be more kind of responsive in real time, yeah. I think is really exciting um, and something that data can make, make happen. So do you feel like you would offer information about where you were to have the city respond to you in, in, in a way? I don't want to be... You know, having Big Brother look behind my back all the time, I, I would really dislike that. So, so it's, it's a very fine line of, you know, how much data I would want to share or the way in which that data is shared. Any data that we would ever collect is only for the intent of actually, like, making the place better for people and being very thoughtful from the beginning of how do we really preserve everyone's privacy throughout so that entire process. collecting that? 
Well, it'll vary based on any of the types of things that we're talking about. The magician wants you to look at their hands, but what's going on over there? The hands right now is like, let's talk about buildings or gadgets or, or autonomous vehicles or whatever else. What's going on, you know, where no one's looking for the most part, is that there's an, inf there's an enabling infrastructure being built for everything, for the physical spaces, for the home, for all of it. I mean, it's, it basically puts the, the entire world, it blankets it in, in what's, what, what enables the big tech companies' business models. Cities are going to collect more and more data about us. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Data can make our cities better. In the 1800s, a scientist named John Snow stopped an outbreak of cholera by putting a data point on a map every time someone died of the disease. Combining data with the map showed that contaminated water pumps were the culprit. The fight over data in our cities isn't just about privacy. It's about privatization. In the same way that tech companies found a way to monetize our bathrooms, connecting our cities to the internet opens up even more possibilities for business. Imagine the next Uber wants to pay more for the curbs where the most people are standing. Or a new startup wants to direct you to the next free park bench in exchange for ads and your location data, of course. This process has always been framed of how to make a test bed in the Portlands. The question should be, do we want a test bed in the Portlands? Do people want to be having a test bed in a neighborhood where people will live? Is that a concept that anybody here in the room remembers signing off on? Look at the state of the internet. There has been a massive centralization of both its infrastructure and then the companies that are basically the backbone of the internet. So to take those things and replicate them in the physical world, to me, it's like you are going the wrong way. Are we privatizing municipal infrastructure services are public assets and no one has answered me it's all we're working on it we're working on it seems to me before we talk about what they build on the site these are the questions that should have been answered in day one not in the final you know technology and computer science nothing about those things is inherently capitalist Right? Governments can empower themselves with those tools and they can have a public service that knows how to use these tools and, and build that capacity up in government. Even with all the pushback, Sidewalk Labs' plan seemed inevitable. Are there only two choices for the city of the future? A surveillance state or corporate experiment? Barcelona is navigating a middle path, becoming a leader in the design of smart cities, rejecting corporate control of data, and making the state accountable to citizens. For us, data is like another public infrastructure, like water, uh, like electricity, like roads, like the air we breathe. And so this data needs to uh, be a common good for our citizens. We want to move away from surveillance capitalism and enter in a digital economy where data is a common good and we can have collective actions where people are aware of what happens with their data and how they can maximize the benefit of the digital society. In Barcelona, data serves the people. Take the Smart Citizen Initiative. It's a simple sensor that's 3D printed locally and distributed freely. Sensors were installed around the city to collect data about CO2 emissions, pollution, and noise. Citizens then pressured city council to enforce quiet zones. Smart Citizen is a project of Fab Lab Barcelona. The machines and the people here turn information into things, bits into atoms. Instead of just writing a white paper about how we think that the smart city could be, we said, okay, let's make a project out of it. Let's make an experiment. Let's build something. We're a fab lab. We know how to build things. So we can think about ideas, but also build them and test them. We'll make tools for data collection. We'll make tools for data sharing. And we'll see how we engage people into that. If you can make almost anything in a fab lab, then you can make the things that make almost anything in a fab lab, right? Uh, so you can make machines that make machines that make machines. You can, instead of shipping uh, you know, smartphones from China, you can actually make them locally uh, in every city. Okay, you can design something in Barcelona 
and it could be made anywhere in the world. So you don't have to move materials, you move information. In 2014, Barcelona made an audacious pledge. Everything the city needed would be produced locally within 40 years. Clothes, cars, phones, everything. I want Barcelona to be the leading city in the new industrial revolution. What we are doing in the Fab City project, uh, which is, you know, have this large mission on making cities to produce locally what they consume by 2054, uh, is trying to align these Fab Labs as a backbone kind of resource in order to start the transition to local production in cities, but at the same time operating it as a, as a distributed and open network worldwide. So we right now have 28 cities that have pledged to the challenge that we, start, we launched in Barcelona in 2014. The mission is very clear. Let's try to make sure that we can live in this planet without compromising our future. Anyone can join the Fab Lab network online. Their belief is that by producing locally, they'll reduce the waste and carbon cost of shipping materials around the world. It's an urgent mission. Anastasia joined to invent new materials that can be created sustainably. So, they are different materials, and if you want to do one of them, you just follow the recipe. And these are the ones with the food waste. So these ones are with coffee grains, and this one with orange peels. Can this replace plastic? Yes. In 20 years, what do you want this to change? Everybody talks about fast fashion. So why don't we make super fast fashion? It's even faster, you know, like, because people, they want to be consumers. So you say, okay, then if you want to consume, maybe there is a vending machine that is selling you a bioplastic t-shirt. You can wear your bioplastic t-shirt, like Cinderella, and then you can just throw it, but not feel so guilty about it. Then at least, Make it so that it is something that is not harming the planet, no? Yeah. To realize the Fab City vision for cities to be self-sufficient in 40 years, we're going to need to figure out how to make food and have a new relationship with nature. The Green Fab Lab was set up in Barcelona's Central Park to get started going from how to make almost anything to how to grow almost anything. <laughs> Self-sufficiency in materials, in production, uh, in food production, energy and water. It's about understanding what we can consume and what we produce. But the Fab Labs are wonderful places to create and to have the power of production in your hands. So when I came here, I saw the Fab Lab Barcelona and I thought, this is the place for me because it allows me to, to engage in my own projects and to do so at you know, quite an advanced level. Building on Smart Citizen, Jonathan and friends created open source beehives. From the buzzing sounds inside the hive, software translates this data so beekeepers can monitor the health of the bees. You can download all of the files and you can put that onto a CNC machine and make one yourself. A little bit like an IKEA kit, and you can mount it yourself. No screws, no glues, you just bang it together. Bees are losing their habitat, and uh, they're being managed, highly managed. And so it's kind of interesting to just let them do what they would want to do, um, observe them, not try and maximize their production, but work with them um, in, in a little bit more, in a slower way. When I set out to discover how the internet was evolving, I don't think I imagined I'd be squatting in the dirt looking at a beehive. It's crazy, but it's probably less crazy than the internet of things would seem to anyone alive 30 years ago. We are at the beginning of something. If somebody looks at this beautiful place in the mountains in the middle of Barcelona, they would say, that's too small to power an entire city. Is this a hint of what it looks like in the future? The hardest part of, of, of the transformations that um, we, I believe we are part of is not to envision the next 50 years uh, or the next 40 years in the case of Fab City, but it's actually what happens in the next two years. 
like uh, how how do we start how the transition looks like we have been only using oil in like an, an very infinite part right so um, yes uh, you know we can envision a future without oil the problem is to start to building it now uh, and, and 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 I think that's that's the main challenge we need to build the transition not and I think that it's enough of building like a visions of the future mm -hmm. frameworks it's, and pledges and yeah, exactly. declarations yeah, I think that that's enough it's just an excuse to have a timeline but now it's about building it sometimes I listen to myself and it's like this is so naive like what are you saying but it's like at the same time it's like but what what other alternative I have you can make it happen no so I, in the early days of the internet, there were no business models, no users to capture, no data to mine. The purpose of the web was written right across its first logo. Just the words, let's share what we know. What I saw in Barcelona was the first step towards people using that invitation to share knowledge to solve the biggest problems before us. The UN panel on climate change says we now have 11 years to transform the entire world. We're in a disaster mode from here on in. Anyone that believes this is the age of progress, that's history. This is the age of resilience. Can we do this in a few years? We laid out the entire first industrial revolution in 30 years. It can be done in 20 years, but we now have to wake up. And that's where this digital revolution will help. If Christina stays true to her mission, she has the power to change millions of women's lives for the better. And her promise to do right by their data could actually be more profitable than selling them out. Entering mass production in China, she gained something to keep her honest that she didn't have before, users. This is my keg. Ah, <laughs> I'm not going to. So I have the keg app right here. This is my graph. I think Christy will succeed because the world is uh, comprised of 51% of women and there's so little investment in our health. Because knowledge is power, right? And I don't have time to wait around and uh, get pregnant God knows when. I'm already 39, I have no time to waste. <laughs> Christina launched a crowdfunding campaign that sold out in less than two days. She had enough orders to bypass Amazon and sell directly to the women who needed her product. Women who had made their reservations on our waiting list is around 4,000 people right now, within a few weeks. So it's quite crazy. The other alternative you have on the market right now, it looks like this, it's crazy. Good luck. <laughs> Technology is neither good, nor bad, nor neutral, especially the internet. We can use it to make things in new ways, or we can make things that use us. On the upside, big leap forward potentially for humanity, because we can now envision the whole human race connecting with each other virtually and physically uh, everywhere at every moment across the earth. We're bringing the human family together. Our generation, this moment, will be looked back on as an enormous turning point for humans. Like, now that we're all connected, now the real story starts. I think we are the child of the internet. You know what I mean? The other internet hasn't disappeared. It's there, but we are just looking somewhere else. Then. Just press start shooting. Wishing for the internet of my youth is kind of bad parenting because that internet isn't going to do these guys any good. It's like complaining about how cool the telegraph was. All of this worry about the internet really is old school, because for them, it's just life. Where did you get those images? Uh, y you know, on Google. Yeah. What I would say to the person who says the internet is gonna ruin the world, I would say, you may be right. But I hope you're not right. I hope so too, kid. Maybe my internet is getting old and boring, but your internet can be anything.